Welcome to the School of Surgery podcast on chest trauma today. My name's Andrew Dejic, I'm a core surgical trainee at Derby Hospital and I'm joined with Mr. Adam Brooks, consultant trauma surgeon at Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. So the first thing we'll do is just go through some of the objectives for the podcast today on chest trauma. So firstly, to be able to differentiate clinically between a hemophorax and a pneumophorax and the basis for safe chest strain insertion. We're going to talk about the clinical relevance of needle decompression in chest injury. We're also going to discuss the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade and the appropriate use of investigations to aid making this diagnosis. We're then going to move on to talk about fluorocotomy and when this may be necessary in trauma and to discuss the indications in practical terms of performing a resuscitative fluorocotomy in the emergency department. And finally, what can be achieved surgically and sort of physiologically really by performing a resuscitative fluorocotomy. Okay, so I think we'll begin by talking about hemophorax and pneumophorax. So obviously patients with penetrating chest injuries are clearly vulnerable to an array of pathologies based on the number of key structures within the chest. Two of the commonest injuries are haemophorax and pneumophorax, and these can often be dealt with by the junior doctor in the emergency department. So, Mr. Brooks, could you take us through some of the clinical signs that you would look for to identify and differentiate between a haemophorax and a pneumophorax? So, um, first up, depends where you are, obviously, if you're, it's very different if you're on the roadside to if you're in the emergency department, but in the emergency department where most uh, people listening to this will actually see the uh, see a patient. Uh, really, it's absence of breath sounds on the affected side. That's the most important thing. In a conjunction with being uh, having having low saturation, probably a high respiratory rate, and then to differentiate between the two. Classically, you're supposed to be able to uh, you know percuss hemothorax being dull and pneumothorax, even a simple pneumothorax, not even a tension pneumothorax, uh, won't be dull, be more resonant uh, to percussion. But in the emergency department, in a recess. That's really not practical. Uh, most of us, unless the patient is absolutely crashing, markedly hypoxic, um, you're more likely than not to get a chest x-ray. Or in the, re- in the real world, um, most of these patients will run through and still get a CT scan. I guess with penetrating trauma, the other thing is if there's a, a blowing or a sucking chest wound, that pretty much gives the game away that uh, there's some problem in the thorax. Okay, thank you very much. And I think just for completeness then, could you just take us through what interventions and the anatomical landmarks for insertion of a chest strain? I see. You need to make sure you've got the diagnosis, and that's always going to be helped help by some form of imaging. Uh, most you know, often a chest X-ray and penetrating trauma or a CT scan. So on the appropriate side, what we could do is put a j- drain in safely, and the first thing to do is throw the trocar away and never use it. It comes with a chest drain. That's dangerous, um, and it's not not really defensible using that uh, at all. So the safe place I would start, say, is fourth or fifth intercostal space, just anterior to the, to the mid-axillary line. So it's, uh, in, in females, you need to move the breast tissue uh, up and out of the way. And there's a sort of triangle of safety there, um, just behind the pectoral major muscle. You don't want to go through the pe- major muscle. Um, and that's the, that's the key uh, safe area to put your chest strain so moving on then, we're all taught about the potentially life-saving use of needle decompression to relieve a tension pneumothorax. Practical terms, I'm just wondering, um, is this a procedure that you or your colleagues often opt for, or do you tend to just put a, tra- a chest strain in in the first instance? Um, because I guess chest strains could be performed quite quickly. So when might you use needle decompression? Practically, when would you just put a chest strain in straight away? So again, it depends where you are. Because um, if I if I'm working on um, on the helicopter or the roadside, then you know I'm gonna, and I think the patient's got a tension pneumothorax. So um, that's physiological instability as a result of a, a of a pneumothorax and the um, uh, both shunt uh, of um, blood supply as a result of that, an inability to inflate that lung and blood being sucked into that side of the chest, collapsing the lung further. So if I'm on the roadside, I probably will do a needle uh, decompression in the second intercostal space. But in hospital, um, no, I wouldn't. Um, I think that we, we, we do from time to time reassure ourselves there's a hiss of air, but in reality, anybody with positive pressure ventilation at that point is going to have a hiss of air. 
Um, and it just, for me, takes as much time for us to get a, uh, uh, a drain in as it really does to put a needle in. So I think it's pretty rare in the hospital environment that we have to do that. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, move on now to talk about cardiac tamponade, um, where fluid, often blood, clicks within the pericardial sac. So could you just start by telling us clinical examination findings um, there could be in a patient with a cardiac tamponade? So you've got all the classic uh, uh, findings um, of, of Beck's triad, muffled heart sounds, um, etc. But in reality, you know, it's a difficult diagnosis to make in the emergency department. I think the, the key thing is you've got an, yeah, a wound which is going into the cardiac box. And by that, I mean, I mean the box that goes from clavicles down to ziffy sternum. Uh, and the lateral markings of that are the nipples on both sides. And that's anterior and posterior. So if the wound's traversed into there, you have to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, and you're going to struggle to get you know, great clinical signs in the emergency department. What we tend to use now, what we use all the time to help us make that diagnosis is ultrasound. Uh, and we were also looking for uh, a stripe of fluid within the peri pericardium. Alternatively, if you've got a patient whose blood pressure is very low or their um, uh, you know, peri arrest, yeah, and you could ultrasound or you could directly intervene at that point. I don't really think there's any, well, there's no value at all in putting a central pressure and looking at high central venous pressure because it's to be affected by the fluid you're giving. And every emergency department has ultrasound in it, every, you know, so really that's an uh, investigation uh, of choice. Okay, that's great. And um, I think this brings us on nicely to um, pericardius and tesis, which is quite heavily taught in ATLS courses. I have to say I haven't seen pericardial stentesis being used myself in uh, trauma situations, but I was just wondering from your point of view, really, uh, under what circumstances could pericardial stentesis be used in trauma, uh, if at all, really? Yeah, I mean, so in 20 years I've done it twice, um, and I think the main indication for that is really not being sure uh, at the time many, many years ago uh, that I really wanted to do a thoracotomy in that patient. Uh, and it's there, not, you know, you should only proceed to surgery if you have the appropriate skills and training to do surgery, otherwise you're going to cause a lot more harm and the outcome is going to be the same. So it's there for a reason, but it tends to be ineffective, the blood tends to be clotted, uh, and you're never quite sure how far you put the needle in, so it's, you know, though it's there in the books, as a stopgap measure, it's no more than that, and something if the surgical skill there with uh, you know, experience and training in doing an emergency thoracotomy then that's much more likely to get a good outcome than a pericardiocentesis. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've touched upon uh, thoracotomy there, actually, and if we could just take that a little bit further and start by mentioning some of the indications, perhaps, for performing an urgent thoracotomy uh, in theatre. Um, in theatre or in the emergency department? So, um, or we can deal with both. Shall we... Should we start by talking about um, when we might do a, an urgent thoracotomy for a trauma patient, so in theatre? Okay, so the first thing is to say the most important driver is physiology of the patient. That drives all our decision making now in trauma surgery. Um, you know, it should be really trauma physiology. So we look at the physiology of the patient and then we try and fit that with what we expect the injury to be and then do the appropriate thing. So the patient who um, comes in hypotensive but but uh, still has uh, you know palpable central pulse is very different to the patient who comes in who is in cardiac arrest and those are two very separate groups and equally patients who've got a stab wound to the heart with tamponade are different to those who have a uh, lung injury who have a hemothorax so I guess those patients who you know looking at those patients with hemothorax the ones that are going to go to theatre are people where you put the chest strain in we drain a massive hemothorax we watch it, the bottle fills up, and immediately gives us more than one and a half or so litres of blood, um, or it continues to bleed over the next period of time. Um, those are people, certainly the former with large volume hemothorax and any element of instability, uh, people we're going to take to the, the operating room uh, with a view to doing a thoracotomy to look for the source of that, that uh, bleeding. I think we'd be careful about the, the hard rules of 200 mils an hour, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of potential reasons for that um, in penetrating trauma or in blunt trauma, uh, and including making sure the patient's adequately resuscitated and they're, quite, and they're not coagulopathic. Those things need to be corrected in that latter group. It's important thing to say that 90% of 
or more with thoracic trauma can be managed either conservatively or with a chest train. And it's very much the tip of the iceberg of patients who actually need an operation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think you brought up a very important point there that ATLS guidelines really are guidelines and as uh, useful as they are, um, they should be treated as such. Um, I think so for the final topic we'll talk about, which we have touched upon already, is the use of resuscitative thoracotomy in the emergency department. So in what type of situation or what type of patient do you think this sort of procedure could be indicated or necessary? So the easiest group of patients who have penetrating trauma to the cardiac box, as we mentioned before, that area between the nipples uh, uh, anteriorly clavicles and, and sternum, and that you know, is a three-dimensional box shape. Patients who have vital signs um, with you know, markedly low blood pressure or tachycardic with an injury in that area, somebody that we would be considering doing a thoracotomy for, and if the blood pressure drops further or they have a cardiac arrest within the emergency department or within five minutes or so of, uh, of arriving in the emergency department, that's a group where Unequivocally, we should be looking at uh, thoracotomy, emergency room thoracotomy. The caveat, and caveat that clearly is that the needs, person needs to be doing it, needs to be trained and have some experience, as is the rest of the team, because it, it would be inappropriate to do if you had no experience or training within that, within that technique. The, the more controversial areas, patients, well, one of the more controversial areas is patients who um, have lots of vital signs pre hospital a little greater time before they arrive in hospital. So when you start getting to the 10 minute point, you know, or the 15 minute, and they've lost, you know, they've lost vital signs that they have, or they have no signs of life, that becomes a very tricky to continue to decision to make whether you're going to proceed with a thoracotomy in that group. Personally here, we use a 10 minute rule. If you've lost your vital signs within 10 minutes, we'll do it if you've had appropriate CPR. Um, it's a procedure we quite a lot of uh, within our trauma centre. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, and with regards to that, so performing this procedure, hopefully a major procedure in the middle of the emergency department, um, are there any sort of, apart from surgical and technical difficulty, are there any particular problems that you find deal doing this procedure in A&E as opposed to in theatre? So logistics or anything else which is unforeseen? So the main logistic thing is lighting, but I think you really got to. It's all about training and getting your the structure you know, uh, sorted out to do it. So you know, we have a thoracotomy tray down in the emergency department. We have thoracotomy extras down there. We get someone in. Uh, theatre nurses come down and will scrub for us. So we have a system set up, and then, you know, if you haven't got a system set up, you're going to find it a little bit bumpy. So um, with the appropriately trained, so with the appropriately trained. Uh, team, I don't find it a difficult thing to do. The worst thing is is lighting, but again, you know what we teach nationally and internationally is um, a left antilateral thoracotomy immediately converted to the clamshell, because you don't have access in left antilateral thoracotomy to do anything apart from open the pericardium, which can be life saving to release cardiac tamponade, internal cardiac massage, which again you need to be shown how to do, and to press to c compress the descending aorta. That's not cross clamping it, it's compressing it. Cross clamping is actually quite tricky, but you know, we can train anybody to be able to compress that. And that whilst we're doing that surgically, it's for our colleagues in the emergency department to help us run that car that cardiac arrest so they've got the big picture while we're doing the technical part. And I think that's a very important point you raise about uh, the importance of um, having systems, training and appropriate experience to do these sort of things. Um, the very final question really, just slightly to play devil's advocate, is um, you know, we, we do these things for trauma patients, we open we can open their chest in the emergency department. For example, I don't think I've ever heard of a, a laparotomy in the emergency department for a patient with perhaps a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm to cross clamp the aorta to gain proximal and distal control. Um, is there a reason for this? I mean the obvious sort of answer would be the patient's physiology is probably quite different than the, the demographic of the patient. Um, but why why do we open chests and, and not abdomens in the emergency room? So 
like you know, sort of dealing with your first first question, we really like, the reason we're doing it is the survival from a solitary stab wound to the heart out of ho out of hospital cardiac arrest is better than a, an out of hospital medical arrest. So you know, these results are better than doing out of hospital CPR and patient being brought in. So that's why we do it because it's, it, it saves lives. The reason we don't like doing laparotomy in the emergency, emergency room is. You know, um, there are too many organs in the abdomen. There's very few organs in the chest. You've got a heart and two lungs, essentially, and a couple of tubes passing through it. It's easy to get to. You go into the abdomen and you've got le you know, m m meters of small bowel, colon, liver, you name it, you know, 20 or so organs in the abdomen. It's really tricky there without lighting, without retractors, to get the appropriate uh, site of bleeding and stop it. You know, we have and will still do for the hypotensive patient with injury to the abdomen, we have opened the chest to clamp the aorta. You know, we don't do it, as you say, in patients who have aneurysms because they're either arrested or we can get them to theatre. Uh, and we would always prefer to get the patient, the thoracosmic patient, to theatre um, rather than uh, operate in the emergency room. They're a totally different group of patients, so you know, you're not going to transfer an arrested patient with a stab wound from recess to the operating room because you're going to have a bad outcome. You need to reinstall cardiac output straight away. So that, I think there are you know, fairly marked differences, reasons why we do thoracotomy in the emergency room for penetrating trauma and we don't do laparotomy. Absolutely great. Thank you very much. So just in summary really, um, so what, what we've dealt with in this podcast, we've spoken about the identification and management of pneumothorax and haemothorax. We have discussed the clinical signs that raise suspicion of a cardiac tamponade and some of the investigations we can use to confirm this. And finally, we've also dealt with the use of thoracotomy both inside and outside the operating room. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another podcast brought to you by School of Surgery. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook at School of Surgery on iTunes, on Podomatic at schoolofsurgery.podomatic.com and finally by searching School of Surgery on YouTube. Thank you very much and see you next time.